Welcome to Good Screenwriting, I'm Trevor Meyer, and today we're going to be talking about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Now, I'm not going to bury the lead here. Uh, I give this movie a 4 out of 5. Now, I gave the first Guardians of the Galaxy a 5 out of 5. Uh, this is a 4 out of 5 now. Some people make the mistake of thinking, this movie sucks because it's not as good as the first one. No, it can still be a good movie, uh, it's just not as good as the first one, alright? So, uh, I'm going to lead with the downside, just because ultimately this is going to be a positive review. Alright, so, I'm going to compare it to Empire Strikes Back a little bit, in that there's a big chunk of the movie where not much is happening. It's a slower paced movie. It's it's almost a one to one metaphor, uh, you know, comparison between Guardians of the Galaxy and Star Wars and Volume Two and The Empire Strikes Back. You know? The first one is very fast paced, always moving the ball, literally. Uh they have a lot of places to go and people to meet and there's constant movement, lots of action. And the second movie is just a lot of sitting around and talking. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, I mean, look, spoilers, spoilers. If you haven't seen this movie, stop watching, okay? In the first 12 minutes, we get a couple of cool action sequences. And then they meet up with Ego. Uh, the Guardians meet up with Ego, who is Star-Lord's father. And Peter Quill from the first 12 minutes to about like 80 minutes into the movie um maybe not 80 like 75 minutes into the movie so there's a good like hour of the movie where he's not in any physical danger at all and that hour is called act two <laughs> all right so the middle hour of the movie the hero of the story is not in any physical danger whatsoever. There's no action, all right? And that's that's the part that, that kind of drags it. And they, they kind of disguise it a little bit uh, by having um, intercut with Rocket and Groot and Yondu. They have a lot of action because they get captured by uh, the Ravagers who sort of uh, have a mutiny against Yondu. And then they got to escape, and you know all all the action in the in the middle hour of the movie comes from Yondu and Rocket and Groot, and uh, it picks up a little bit toward the end uh, when Gamora fights um, Nebula, but yeah, there's a huge chunk of this movie, like the bulk of the movie, where Star Lord basically just sits around talking. And it gives them a chance to handle some deeper themes like, you know, fathers and sons and family, denial, things like that. So I guess that I appreciate it on that level. It's it's a lot like Iron Man 2 when I, when I think about it. And again, people exaggerate how bad Iron Man 2 is. It's not a bad movie. It's just not as good as the first one. All right. So Iron Man 2... The, the contrast wasn't as stark, pun intended, between 1 and 2 of Iron Man because, look, in Iron Man 2, yes, Tony Stark spends a lot of time just hanging out and not a lot of forward momentum in that movie. And that wasn't as noticeable to me because in the first Iron Man, he does a lot of the same thing. There's a lot of talking. There's a lot of slow preparation and just kind of hanging out in the first Iron Man. So uh, it didn't strike me as odd that that was what happened in Iron Man 2. I think that Iron Man 2 has a few more flaws in it, but the pacing is relatively the same. Guardians of the Galaxy uh, Volume 2, it's a very stark contrast from the first one because, again, the first one was constant action, always moving, Lots of moving pieces to it. This one, a lot of mellow, just mellow, not mellow drama, but mellow drama, you know? Uh, it was very low-key. Even the soundtrack was much more low-key this time around. Um, not because... Now, I'm going to say that the songs 
in the second one, I don't know if they're as popular or as well known as the songs in the first movie. Not that they're not great songs, but pretty much every song that comes up in the first movie, even if you're a millennial, you know that music. You've heard those songs before. The second movie, for this younger generation, not quite as recognizable. You know, there are some songs that I think I've heard for the first time in this movie. Uh, I didn't hear it anywhere else. This is the movie I know that song from. <laughs> so, uh, an interesting soundtrack, but again, the first one had a drive to it. It was very uh, loud, poppy, almost rock music. And the second one's very mellow. It's very groovy, if you will, <laughs> which is appropriate to the theme of the movie since they're on a planet, which is basically... Uh, heaven, I guess, is the metaphor they're going for. The Garden of Eden. Ego's planet. And it makes me think of Cloud City from Empire Strikes Back again. Like, the main heroes are spending all their time on this planet where everything seems perfect, but we know there's something going on underneath the surface. Uh, we know that Ego is basically a cross between Lando Calrissian and Darth Vader, He's got something up his sleeve. He's just not showing his hand yet. So, all the action comes from Rocket and Groot and Yondu for the middle chunk of the movie. And this movie has a really great climax, too. It's Peter Quill fighting his father in sort of the center of this massive planet because Ego's full name is Ego the Living Planet. And the idea is that he is a planet. And he just takes a small part of himself and manifests it as a humanoid-looking guy who happens to resemble Kurt Russell. So, there is a great use of uh, the song Break the Chain while they're fighting in the core of this planet. And Peter, just like Luke Skywalker, has learned to develop his powers as basically an immortal. So, he's got the power to control matter and light and he can reshape the planet into certain things so he's fighting his dad and he he turns himself into pac-man which is an awesome reference because <laughs> early earlier on in the movie uh it, once he figures out that he can build stuff with his mind he's like i'm gonna build some weird stuff man i'm gonna have pac-man and all kinds of things so when he actually turns into pac-man at the end to like basically eat his father, you know, and, and defeat him. I don't know if he defeats him right then and there, but in the climactic battle, that's really entertaining to see. It got a big laugh in the theater that I was in. So, oh, and the opening credit scene, Baby Groot dancing. It's just like in the first movie where, you know, the opening credits are played out over Peter Quill doing his Indiana Jones sequence while singing Come and Get Your Love and dancing through the temple. So, we get a very similar thing here. They basically took that and mashed it up with dancing baby Groot at the end of the first one. And we get... <laughs> it's such a brilliant sequence. I love it so much. Uh, where the opening credits are baby Groot dancing to Mr. Blue Sky. And in the background... The other Guardians are fighting this big tentacled monster, and there's explosions in the background, and, you know, arms are getting chopped off of this thing, and uh, they're running and shooting and slicing and dicing. And in the foreground, the center of our attention, the camera's holding on Baby Groot as he just dances across the platform to Mr. Blue Sky. Brilliant opening credit sequence. I love that so much. They had a lot of great development for Nebula this time around. It kind of reminded me of uh, The Fate of the Furious, what they did with Jason Statham's character, where it wasn't like a, a thing where Loki joins Thor for one movie, but you know he's going to betray him in the end, and then they and then they go bad. Or in X2, when Magneto joins the X-Men, but he really has an ulterior motive. Nebula is actually developed as a sympathetic character this time around, and it turns out that maybe... When they were kids, it was Gamora who was kind of the jerk, and Nebula just kind of developed to survive, and maybe 
Gamora was the one who started this whole conflict between them. So they kind of established that Nebula is not actually a bad person. So that that was a great way to do it because I love it so much that, uh, and this is a little bit spoilery for the fate of the Furious, not really spoilery, but when Jason Statham joins the team, I'm thinking he's obviously the bad guy. He's going to betray the whole team and all that. But they play him as an actual sympathetic character who thought he was doing the right thing in the previous movie where he was a villain. So it was a more complex and more entertaining way to develop a villain. And Kurt Russell, he was great. Obviously, he's got an evil plan that he thinks is doing the right thing. Uh, so he could even, you know, if he survived, which I don't think he did, but if he had survived, he could come back conceivably as a more benevolent character. I don't think he will, but that'd be interesting. Mantis was great. Drax was great. Yondu was great. There was a little bit toward the end, though, that I didn't really... It didn't land with me, uh, which was Yondu... Again, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Don't listen to this if you haven't seen the movie yet. Uh, Yondu dies... And that's not the part that bothers me. The part that bothers me is, you know, after the whole thing with Peter's dad, Yondu says, you know, that man may have been your father, but he wasn't your daddy. And then Yondu dies. And then they have this whole funeral where uh, Peter Quill actually realizes that Yondu was more of a father to him. You know, it was the missing father figure he was always looking for, and he never could see it. Now, there are two ways that they could have made this work. They either should have set up earlier on that they actually had a father-son relationship, or, here's the better way, if they were two tough guys who didn't want to acknowledge that they actually felt that way and were father-son type people with each other, then they should have been more subtle at the funeral, alright? They shouldn't have hit it on the nose like, he was a father figure to me. It, it should have been unspoken, you know, speaking of unspoken things. <laughs> uh, so, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Uh, that Just that Yondu thing. It reminds me again of Iron Man 2 where, look, the, the whole daddy issues thing for Tony Stark comes out of nowhere. Uh, and you may be, you know, uh, rewriting history there if you don't think that. But if you go and watch the first Iron Man, it kind of seems like he had a lot of respect for his dad and that there's no sign whatsoever in the first movie that Tony Stark had a problem with his father. All right, If anything, he was just trying to live up to the great man that his father was. In the second one, we still get that, and it's not until halfway through the movie that he says for the very first time that he and his dad didn't get along, that they didn't like each other, that, you know, that he said he didn't even love them. Uh, so... It didn't land, really, when 10 minutes later, literally 10 minutes later in the movie, uh, Tony Stark has his big catharsis with his dad, where uh, through the power of, you know, 8mm film, or whatever that was, uh, he has a message from his father who says, you know, uh, you're basically, you're the greatest thing I ever did, son, you know? So, it's like, oh, that really would have been a touching moment if I had known that he had daddy issues more than 10 minutes ago, all right? It's such a tiny little arc that didn't play at all because they didn't set it up soon enough. And it's the same thing here. Like, the first time I even got the sense that Yondu was a father figure to Quill was right when he says, he may have been your father, but he wasn't your daddy. And then they go into the funeral where they say he was like a father to him. I'm like, wait, really? Like... Look, Yondu's a cool character and all, but I thought he was just some douchebag who kidnapped a kid and used him for his own personal gain. Like, if they were a father-son thing, then that should have been set up way earlier. Or, or like I said, play it out exactly the way it is, but be more subtle when they die. You know, when Yondu dies, be more subtle with the funeral. Alright? So, again, just a few minor gripes. This movie is better than anyone has any right to expect it to be. I mean, it's a follow-up to Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, they did go deeper with the characters. 
and they did go slower with the action and i guess that's okay cuz there is something oddly magnetic about it i mean i want to watch it over and over again because i like how deep they dived into the characters it just gets a little slow in some spots because there's no physical danger for the main characters for like an hour straight in the middle of the movie like the main body of the movie so that being said i give it a 4 out of 5 all right i think that's that's a good thing it's 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 not great, but it's not bad, all right? It's good. It's a good movie, okay? Well worth seeing. Well worth the money you'd pay to go see it. I recommend. Go check it out if you want to have a good time. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it, okay? So, what do you think? Did you see this movie? What do you think about all the stuff I just said? Do you agree, disagree? Put it in the comments below, okay? This is Good Screenwriting, and I'm Trevor Meyer. See you next time.